Okay, I think I think we should um, get started. And uh, indeed, uh, the afternoon part of our session is um, quite um, busy as well. Um, the first section that we are um, presenting to, to you today after the lunch break will be uh, concentrating on uh, multi-user capabilities of, of the system that uh, Massive is developing. And that means in the plain language just how we can enable traveling with friends. This section uh, will be presented to you by Massive technical lead Ahim von der Emse from ha Hakon. Um, and um, I hope you're ready for it. Uh, sure. Ahim, the floor is yours. OK, uh, thanks, Anena. Um, well, as Anena is saying, so uh, we learned till now um, how trips can be planned. Uh, we learned how um, um, mobility package can be created. Uh, but what if you want to travel with your friends? So uh, as Anena was already saying, um, we have defined uh, the so-called multi-user capabilities. Um, and these multi-user capabilities, uh, which you will see on the next slide, um, we have defined three um, use cases. One is uh, travel sharing, second one is travel arranging, and a third one is traveling with groups. So travel sharing means that you want to share your trip with someone else um, to give him the information about the current status uh, of your travel. So for example, departure times, arrival times, delays, and so on. Travel arranging um, is focusing on, well, as the name says, uh, arranging trips uh, for someone else. So for example, for your children, for your parents, uh, or for colleagues uh, in a uh, company. Uh, and then third one, travel group in groups, um, defines um, how you will be able to travel with a group for um, hiking, for um, biking, and so on and so forth. These are the thing, uh, the three um, uh, use cases. So let's start with a little bit deeper look into travel sharing. So in the next slide, you can see um, that you will have a sharer, the one who is uh, informing someone about your travel, and a follower. Um, and in this case, we have defined a Susan uh, as a CEO of a company who wants to share her trip with a follower with the office uh, in, in the name of Matthias, um, so that uh, Matthias is always be informed um, how the CEO of the company um, is going with his travel, for example, to inform partners uh, of any kind of delay. On the next slide, uh, we will have a a um, few slides, a few um, screenshots um, of how this can be done. So um, if you are sharing a journey, um, it is done as always. So no need to talk into detail in this. Once you have defined your journey, um, you can see the button share. So you can see that share. Um, uh, thank you. You can share the, your trip uh, with the follower. So you have to integrate um, the email of the company or the, the email of the one uh, that you want to share your travel with, uh, which then uh, can be um, entered into the slide on the right side, uh, on in the screen of the right side. So in the next um, slide, um, you will have the view of the follower. So the follower sees um, as you can see on the uh, left screenshot, uh, that the CEO of your company has shared your trip, um, and um, that uh, trip then will be shown on your My Trip section uh, of the Travel Companion. So there, there is trip is uh, marked as shared trip. So then on the next slide. Um, we come to the um, travel arranger, which is a bit more complicated. Uh, so in this case, uh, we have a principal and we have an arranger. So the principal is the one um, who wants to inform someone, the arranger, uh, to set up trips for you. 
Um, so you can delegate to join the organization. Um, so first of all, you have to uh, define the ranger. You have to grant permissions for sure. Um, and for sure, you will be able to delete an arranger um, and you need to receive the journey information. Um, the arranger on the other side uh, can accept or decline um, the request. Um, he can check his granted permissions. Uh, then he can plan and due to the permissions uh, buy a ticket and inform the principal about that. So again, we have uh, Susan as our CEO uh, and Matthias in the office um, who um, needs to plan trips for her. On the next slide, um, we see some screenshots uh, how this can be done. Um, so first of all, um, the um, principal needs to define and travel arranger. So in this case, um, he needs to, to add an, an um, email um, and forward this email um, which is done in the background uh, of the system uh, to the arranger. Um, in the middle of these screenshots, uh, you will see this um, permission that you can give him. So uh, shopping uh, and booking and issuing. Um, and then um, you can see on the, on the right um, screenshot, um, the list of the arrangers <clears throat> of your journeys. So in the next slide, um, we then will see the um, arrangers view. So uh, first of all, you can decline or accept um, the wish uh, and the invitation of the um, principal. Um, and um, the principal uh, now um, has, uh, once he has accepted this, um, to arrange trips for the CEO in this case, uh, and he can see as well the permissions uh, that he has granted. Then when you start to uh, plan a trip on the next slide, um, you see on the bottom the, the important uh, planning for a CEO company. So you see when you're now planning a trip that you were doing this uh, for the CEO, so for your principal. So again, a uh, trip is planned as usual. Um, and um, then on the next slide, um, we see the principal view. So the principal view is um, you will get an information um, notification uh, that there is a book, uh, that there is a trip uh, that has been booked. Um, he sees uh, again in his My Trip section um, the um, booked trips. Um, in this case, planned by the travel arranger. And for sure, he can see um, the ticket, um, which is um, necessary uh, for conductors to prove if you're uh, correct on your train. So this is the um, idea of um, the travel arranging. And on top of this, uh, on the next slide, um, you will see uh, multi-user capabilities for traveling in groups. Uh, in this case, um, the idea is that an administration um, can be defined by someone or someone can, can, can be the administration of, of groups. He can set up groups uh, and he can add or delete members to this group. And uh, then he can, uh, for this group that he has uh, organized, uh, arrange um, the journeys. Um, he can invite um, members of this group, uh, as you can see here on the right side, um, and they all will see the different trips uh, that the um, admin of that group um, has defined for them. So on the next slide, um, we can see how the um, group can be set up. Uh, so the group is given a name. In this case, uh, it's a hiking club, um, and they want to be somewhere for a hiking tour. Um, in the middle of these screenshots, uh, you can see that uh, Claire, in this case, um, is invited uh, to this group. Uh, and uh, once the group is set up uh, on the right screenshot, uh, you can see that um, the uh, group consists of three members, so the admin uh, and two members. Um, for sure, you can 
as well delete members. So if they are not willing to be there or if they do not have the time to follow this um, group or this trip, um, you can just delete them. On the next slide, um, you can now plan your trip for this hiking group. Uh, as well, uh, again, uh, it is shown uh, in the top of the screen. You plan this uh, trip, uh, you book this trip, <clears throat> and uh, after the uh, ticket is uh, booked and issued, it appears on the booked trips area um, of the members uh, of that group, which we will see on the on the next screen. And um, well, um, this is all for um, traveling with um, multi-user capabilities uh, within the course of um, massive project. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ahim. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, yeah, so our next session, uh, which is also concentrating on um, passengers and passengers experience, will be presented to you by a massive um, colleague, Johan Duga um, from CS Group. So Johan is here today to talk to us about the experiencing a new ways of traveling um, whilst using the um, mixed reality um, equipment. Johan, um, over yes. to you. Let me just put up your slides as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anita. Good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> and thank you all to be with us today. My name is Jean Duga. I work for CS Group, and I'm replacing today Sri Amili, who cannot be present, to present you the work done within Massive Project to experience new way of traveling. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So, we are living in a world full of uh, new technologies where people are always connected with their phone, their shoes, their watch, and soon their glasses. These new devices, especially augmented reality glasses, will change the way we are interacting with the world and, of course, how we will travel. Mixed reality or AR glasses allows us to create experiences to enhance the reality of the traveler with additional virtual information. As this information are virtual and only seen by the traveler, they can be easily adapted according to his need, his preference, and his environment. Thanks to that, we can improve the traveler journey by making it more suitable and adapted to for him. So through our work within the framework of this project, users can plan, manage this trip thanks to the Travel Companion application or the web um, application, and then enjoy his journey thanks to the personal application on his smartphone and location-based experiences on augmented reality glasses. Next slide. So during his trip, while waiting for his train, the traveler used the travel companion application on his smartphone, which is connected to the augmented reality device. The travel companion application gets the list of available location-based experiences and filter them according to the traveler position. Finally, the traveler selects the experience and starts it from the smartphone application and the experience is executed on the mixed reality or multi reality device. Uh, there is no real limit about the type of experience we can create. They can be educational experiences, tourism experiences, entertainment experiences, navigation or guidance experiences. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, of course, to provide experiences to travelers, these experiences need to be created or built. So in order to avoid the complexity of developing experiences from scratch, which requires a lot of time and money, we have developed in this project a tool to create these experiences on both smartphone and AR glasses. 
This tool is targeting, for example, station managers or TSP to help them in developing new attractive experiences in their stations. So thanks to this tool, we can populate experience with assets which can be 3D model, for example, to display virtual character or assistant or 3D map of stations. Or to add to experiences classical multimedia assets like images, videos, sounds, etc. We can also create localized zone, localized point of interest, embed QR code or Bluetooth beacon to build uh, really immersive experiences adapted to the, the environment of the traveler. Uh, next slide. So in this tool, we introduce the concept of activity and building a scenario means creating a graph of successive blocks. A set of simple activities are available in the Composer li library, such as display messages, provide quiz, display notification, or display travel information of the current trip. These activities are orchestrated in relation to each other thanks to a behavior graph editor, in which we can create linear and or non-linear scenario based on data flow or event flow. Uh, next slide, please. So you can see on this slide the process to create an experience. Uh, first, the experience creator need to import the asset constituting the project. So the asset can be classical multimedia, image, sound, everything. After that, it can edit the behavior of the scenario thanks to the graph editor and thanks to the library of predefined blocks and activities. Then some experience parameter must be set. So basically, where the experience must be provided to the traveler, how long the experience is during, the description, splash screen, and some information. All these parameters are used by the travel companion application to filter and propose the experience to the user or the traveler. And finally, the experience can be published and the traveler can execute it on his device, whatever it is a phone or augmented or mixed reality glasses. Next slide, please. So to, to resume, the Mixed Reality Composer is an easy tool to create Mixed Reality experiences. It allows the content creator to provide to the traveler some travel information, thanks to the connection with the travel companion ecosystem. Uh, provide Mixed Reality content, like avatar or assistance. Provide experience using new devices. Provide travel guidance and entertaining content, and also provide um, quick access to the station and access to some points of interest in the station or cities if needed. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. So we developed a demonstration scenario which used all components we have developed within the project. So first component is the LB and Mixed Reality Composer to create the experience. Then the LB Launcher and LBE Watcher, which are the component of the Travel Companion application responsible of filtering and starting the experience. And the Mixed Reality Engine, which is responsible to execute the experience on Mixed Reality glasses. So this scenario takes place once the user has logged in the personal application, plan his journey, book, shop, and pay this ticket, and is now ready to travel. The next slide, please. So to create this scenario, we used the 3D model of the Toulouse Matabio train station. We have access of, to some travel information, and we use some information about shop, position, and opening hours. Uh, we will see just after a video of the scenario, but to place a bit of context, uh, we have imagined a persona called Jamal who is waiting for his train at Toulouse Matabo station. He arrives at the main at the station, has already prepared his trip, 
the enter the, uh, the station and look at his personal application and click on the experience for me menu to see available experiences in this station. He selects a mixed reality compatible experience and put the put on the lens glasses to be guided through the station. So we can now go to the next slide and look at the video. Augmented reality has exciting applications for rail travel and a number of potential benefits for the traveling public as well as station merchants and rail industry employees. Hello, I am Shift 2 Rail, your personal assistant. You are about to discover the future of the traveler's journey. I'll remain at your disposal to help you during your travel. Enjoy your experience. At any moment, you can access your travel information just by clicking on the info icon under your gaze. Today you'll be traveling on the Intercity train 876255 from Toulouse to Barcelona, departing from platform 2. You'll be seated in carriage 1, seat 43. Augmented reality technology can be integrated with physical maps and locations within the station, from shops and amenities to essentials like toilet facilities and platforms. Hello again. Do you remember me? I am your personal assistant, Shift2 Rail. You are about to discover the 3D map of your train station. I can help you discover points of interest in your vicinity. Simply select the point of interest you want to access and you'll receive navigation instructions. How about a quick visit to the cafe before you head to your platform? The time is 10.15 and your train departs in 12 minutes. Do you want me to guide you to your platform? Our augmented reality technology, used with HoloLens, interacts with the real world in real time. It is intuitive, engaging, and requires no technical expertise to be developed thanks to our location-based editor. Applied to rail travel, it can provide young and old passengers alike with timely access to information in the proper context of their environment. Thanks. Well, that's it for me. Um, I don't know if you have a question or something. Thank you, Johan. So, yeah, we will take question uh, at the end of the session. There will be a dedicated uh, slot for you to ask any question re regarding this and other presentations. Um, and we will move now on to the uh, next presentation, which will be um, given by Daniel Johnson uh, from University of Leeds in the UK. And Daniel is here with us to talk about the uh, passengers choice of functionalities and the survey that uh, was conducted um, around that area. Um, Daniel, Hello. the floor yes. is yours. OK, thank you. So this is um, <clears throat> a stream of work from the Shift to Mass project um, where we're looking at um, passenger preferences towards the different functionalities that we can offer through the app. OK, next slide, please. So the, the goal was to identify the, the impact of the IP4 system or ecosystem on passenger behaviour. How do people perceive the different aspects of the technology? And how might we model the impact on passenger behavior? Also, um, more broadly on passenger demand 
and modal shift. So as part of um, <clears throat> addressing those aims, we undertook a review of the evidence in this area and we conducted our own case study uh, based on Liz travelers in Lisbon uh, who we, we surveyed um, and we'll say more about that. OK, next uh, slide, please. So in terms of the review of the research and evidence on mass, we were seeking to establish uh, whether there's consistency or clarity over the mass concept. Uh, I identify user needs, um, review the, the technology, uh, find examples of implementations and uh, any evidence of impacts and understand how this links to the kinds of uh, innovations that are being uh, developed through shift to rail. Next slide, please. So in terms of the research and evidence, uh, we, we found mass is paving the way for faster, better, more connected and personalized transportation methods. Uh, the definition of mass itself does seem rather fuzzy, di different interpretations in uh, in different uh, in different applications and different uh, documentation um, but it all seems to involve some form of public transport at, at its core uh, with the digital technology wraparound um, and, and it will involve elements of real-time information integrated ticketing real-time alerts all aiming to reduce the stress of making a journey. What we found was that few studies had actually quantified the impact on demand side. So, you know, forecasting what the user response is going to be and people's willingness to pay for these um, for these functionalities. Uh, there's not much evidence on that. Uh, next slide, please. So to address that gap, as we saw it, we undertook a passenger survey in Lisbon to try and understand the attitudes and travel behavior of different types of passengers, to understand how passengers were likely to respond to the technology. Uh, and this was to be identified through their preferences and stated changes in behavior. So um, because there wasn't a full scale implementation to for people to actually work with we have to seek out passenger stated responses and this is what i mean by a stated preference approach it's it's essentially a hypothetical approach you know we're, we're pu putting to people um scenarios um you know which aren't actually kind of in existence yet but seeking to to understand how they would respond to those different scenarios. OK, next slide, please. So yes, this is what it what is at the heart of a, a stated preference experiment or SP for short, collects information about individuals preferences based on a series of choices that are put to them in making choices between different options. Individuals responding to the survey make trade offs between what we call attributes and in in our context the attributes of the different functionalities of the the app and uh, they trade off the different functionalities against uh, hypothetical cost uh, and through that under uh, reveal their underlying preferences so e this is an approach that is used even when goods or services aren't charged for you know we're not we weren't telling people this is what you would have to pay it, it we we're trying to establish what they would be willing to pay and that gives us an understanding of their <coughs> strength of preference for the different uh, elements the different functionalities okay next slide please so in terms of the the functionalities that were covered in the survey the the attributes going back to the stated preference terminology uh, the functionalities on the left hand side included journey planning trip tracking trip sharing navigation uh, ancillary functions and uh, mass integration now we provided 
detailed descriptions of those um, functionalities in a kind of preamble to the survey to try and convey as much information without completely deluging the respondents with detail. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see an example screenshot of the, the stated preference part of the survey. So what you'll what you see there are the different functionalities. Uh, and then there's, there's essentially three different options that are put to people in each of these scenarios. So we run through eight different scenarios with with each individual and for each of those eight scenarios, there's a different combination of functionalities of the, the app. Uh, and there's two different options here. You can see one which contains um, only uh, functionality of navigation and onboard services, and that's five euros a month um, cost. And then the option of including disruption alerts, trip information sharing, uh, and this travel pass discount is a, you know, the representation of the mass integration and that's £10 a month. So they could choose between those two options or they could choose not to purchase the app. So the, the idea is, you know, this cost is the cost of the app and embedded within the app is also, of course, the uh, the, the journey planning um, elements, uh, you know, the, the booking and, and and uh, but yeah, buying, pur purchasing, and planning—that that's always within the um, the, the travel, the jo journey planner. On, uh, and then these additional functionalities are kind of uh, yeah, they're, they're the kind of extra elements that, that could be added on in different uh, in different kind of implementations of the app. So. Um, the key, key, other key aspects we featured in the surveying as well as the SP was to understand people's behavioural uh, aspects, uh, how you know their, their travel behaviour um, in Lisbon, personal characteristics as well um, to get to an understanding of people's different backgrounds. OK, next slide, please. Um, so this is what the recruitment was like. We recruited people online through social media platforms of Karish and for Targus um, during May and June. Uh, and we incentivize participation through uh, FNAC vouchers, you know, which is a, uh, a shop for um, books and audio and videos and things. Um, from that, we had 171 valid responses. We had quite a few people responding that didn't adequately provide the information we were looking for. So we filtered those out ended up with 171 respondents, which for a stated preference survey is, is a, a decent uh, a decent number. Um, you can see the age profile there it seems to be skewed towards the younger age groups. In terms of gender, we've got more participation from females. Uh, and then a little bit of context on the travel behaviour. These are largely people who are regular rail users. Over half of the respondents were traveling using rail um, more than five days, uh, sorry, five days a week or more. OK, next slide, please. And we asked about factors that were important in planning a rail journey. As you can see there on the left hand side, cost, journey time and reliability emerge as as predicted. Um, in that they're, they're the most important elements that, uh, of uh, planning a journey, the considerations. But it's useful to note in the context of this work that real time information provision is also an important factor in uh, planning a rail journey. OK, next slide, please. And then in terms of pe passengers attitudes, um, whilst people viewed rail as, as very convenient. 47% said it was uh, that they strongly agreed with the, the statement that rail was convenient uh, and time efficient. Uh, less people were inclined to agree with the with the idea that rail has good information um, and is easy to plan. So you know that there's clearly scope there for Im improvements in um, in the kind of information and planning functionalities that uh, that we're hoping to 
introduced through these uh, through the through this app. OK, thank you. Uh, next slide. And then in terms of the the actual stated preference experiment, what you can see here are the the willingness to pays that that we got from the survey from for the different functionalities. So the these willingness to pays measure people's strength of preference for these different functionalities um, in, in terms of uh, how much they would be willing to pay in euros per month for these functionalities within the app. Uh, so you can see, um, well, what, what was interesting and, and reassuring to note is that people were willing to choose the app. You know, it would have been easy for people just to click they weren't willing to purchase the app in any of the scenarios that they were presented with, but people w did show that they were willing to consider buying, you know, paying for the app uh, and the various different um, functionalities. Uh, what we see from the results suggests that highest preference was for the, the mass integration, um, 18.5 euros a month. Now that's 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 quite high. What um we we're we're concerned that there was a bit of misunderstanding here we try it was hard to convey uh, mass integration really through through just a kind of description but what we we're trying to get people to understand was what we were giving them was the option to purchase a, a monthly pass which would give them discounted access to um you know all the all the public transport and um, bike sharing that was a uh, kind of available in Lisbon. But I think people, some people interpreted this as just a free uh, unlimited travel um, throughout the, the area for a month um, rather than the option to buy the, to buy a monthly ticket with with a discount on uh, well, yeah the discount was on how much the ticket would cost if you bought them separately for the different public transport modes and bike sharing so there's some element of misunderstanding there i think which which leads to the high results but the other functionalities i think are, are interesting and they do tell us it, okay the, the the willingness to pay values do seem rather high um overall but they do give us some sense of the relativity between the different functionalities. So it seems that most important, um, putting putting us to one side mass integration, most important functionalities seem to be trip tracking, uh, trip sharing, and then navigation with onboard services, uh, having the lowest willingness to pay. Um, and we found actually that the the always on function functionalities of of planning and and booking um, they didn't actually have a have a value so um, or so they didn't have a statistically significant value so perhaps people already have these functionalities in their existing tools or they take it for granted that that, that would be available in a in a free app format anyway okay thank you next slide so just to summarize um, our, our research found that mass is a, an important developing concept and the information and, and digital tools um, involved in it clearly have a significant role to play in shaping the future of public transport. Um, but in terms of our findings, uh, information and planning aspects of, of the current um, uh, the current ways of uh, of, of, of planning a journey are not as highly rated as time and convenience aspects of rail. So the scope for you know mass scope for improvements there. Um, we found little previous evidence in terms of tr people trying to understand and value con uh, user preferences for the functionalities compared to the standard values of time, um, cost and reliability that uh, we've seen a lot of studies because they're, they're more straightforward to convey and measure. Uh, whilst we estimated willingness to pay values for the functionalities, these did seem rather high, but they we do think they give an indication of the, the relativities, uh, the relative importance that people attach to the different functionalities. OK, I think that's that's it. Um, any 
Oh, are we is it the Q and A session now? So we'll. It is indeed. <laughs> thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Um, so thank you for this presentation. And in fact, we now encourage everyone in the audience to send us any questions you may have to Daniel's presentation or any previous ones as well. Um, just a reminder to do that. You can use the question and answer uh, functionality um, and just by um, pressing the blue button at the big, uh, at the bottom of it. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to think about the questions you may have. Um, if you have a question to a particular presenter, please um, can I ask you to add their name? Um, that will make it easier to assign it to, to whoever is going to respond to this. So um, I'm going to just let you think for a moment. OK, we do have um, one question uh, that appeared um, and the question is as follows. I guess IP4 system would have distribution and sales licenses for all the transport operators that joined. Would an independent travel agency be able to piggyback on those licenses or would it need to bring evidence of its own licenses with those transport operators. So I will um, ask uh, Juan um, Manuel to answer this this question, if that's OK, um, Juan. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's a very good, pertinent question indeed. Uh, maybe we have not insisted enough that this all this IP4 system and all those things is focused on technology. So what we are providing is tools that will make all the things happening, but we have not deal much with the legal legal part. As it is now, the ecosystem, all those things related to licenses, travel agencies will only be able to uh, be incorporated through the CMMP. For example, as um, developing uh, uh, mobility packages. Or oh, that mass operator that I presented during the presentation could be a travel agency. What will happen next? That's something that we have not analyzed in detail because it's not one of the main scopes of, of, of IP4. We could, but this is just my opinion, we could imagine that a travel agency will have an instance of the whole ecosystem, so they will only incorporate the, the travel service providers that they have license of or we could imagine that uh, there will be like a unique ecosystem and each travel agency will need to develop only the front end the application and the web front and they and they will only be able to operate the ones that have license but as i said very very good question <laughs> but we have not uh, this is not one of the, our main uh, I mean, things that we need to deal, so we have, I cannot give you a proper answer for that. Thank you, Juan. Um, I think um, very good question and very good answer indeed, uh, given given our, our situation. And um, if you have any follow up uh, questions regarding this matter, then as previously, I encourage you to get in touch with us. You can either use the question and answer um, facility here or just get in touch with uh, me or the presenters directly. And we are happy to answer any any questions after the meeting, um, after today's meeting as well. So um, we do have one more question. <laughs> it's a very, um, again, very interesting one. Uh, and it says, if you had to give one piece of advice to a person looking in mobility as a service, what would it be? <laughs> um, it's 
So uh, again, I think that's a, that's a quite complex question. Um, are there any takers from the team who would like to tackle it? Um, I guess on, on. <laughs> from the travel service provider side, I mean, you need to be open to collaboration. So this is a new, uh, it's a new concept that is starting to be deployed. And I think some DSPs, they are still there on their side that they are not still not open to collaborate with other DSPs, but multi services based on collaboration. You cannot create your own. I think it was uh, even in the, in the introduction, it was explained that this is like an opera and you need the whole, all the instruments, all your uh, uh, friends and collaborators working on it. So in collaboration is totally necessary and you need to be open to, to new business models that have not been implemented yet. But if anyone else wants to <laughs> complement it, it's welcome. I, I don't know. I'm not really sure what what perspective the the question was asked from, but you know, from the passenger perspective, uh, it, it it seemed to be from from our findings anyway on our case study, you know, it, it seemed to be the reliability that, that addressing the reliability issues that people have um, through the 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 alerts, notifications, and reaccommodation services. People seem to value that quite highly. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Juan. Um, OK, um, I guess we, we will move move on, um, but do please send those questions through. We will answer them offline as well, um, so please don't be shy. Um, they are very valuable to us. Um, and before we move to the next set of presentations, I actually have um, another interactive break for for us uh, and our audience. So um, I will publish a um, as previously I'll publish a link under which you will be able to answer our next question that we have uh, for you. So um, so you've heard already a little bit about uh, passengers and passenger needs and functionalities that we developed to um, improve passengers experience. Um, but the question for, for our attendees is really, what do you think the functionalities within a mobility as a service um, do passengers want next? So we have a couple of, of predefined answers. We also have a question mark saying any other. Um, so if if you think about something that is not listed, please just post your uh, answer in the uh, question and answer box as well. Um, we welcome any any thoughts on on that area as well. So we already have <laughs> Uh, easy refunds as a chosen option. Oh, there we go. Yeah, this is populated live as you can see, and this is a ranking depending on the number of answers um, chosen um, by you. So payment at the end of the journey, I should probably um, explain this a little bit more. So as you can imagine, within the multimodal travel um, system, you have different travel providers. Your trip have several legs to be taken. So this option, this functionality is talking about you paying, you as a passenger paying only at the end of the trip rather than beforehand. Um, we also have on the second place currently easy refunds. I think this is self-explanatory. Uh, so what happens when uh, one part of your trip has been delayed or cancelled altogether and you are entitled to get a refund? So questions around who is going to reimburse you for, for this. Um, there is an answer. So the third place seems to be travel insurance. So we we don't talk about this sort of solutions yet within the um, IP4 ecosystem, but I guess if we offering one stop shop to the passengers, I suppose travel insurance would uh, be a nice addition to have, especially on the um, uh, international travel. Um, 
we also have we also have access uh, into remote areas. So a very, very uh, important aspect to consider within the um, within uh, any mass environment is uh, how do we accommodate travel in the areas that don't have public transport or regular tra uh, public transport. Um, we do have some any other <laughs> answers, uh, though I can't see um, what is meant by that yet. Um, so yeah, please feel free. So if you've chosen uh, another functionality that you think would uh, benefit passengers, uh, please feel free to just uh, paste it into um, uh, into the the box. Um, okay. Okay, I can see that. I think our responses are quite solid. Oh no, still some changes to it. OK, well, that's that's interesting. Um, that's very interesting. Let's leave it at that for the moment and move on with our presentations then. Um, so thank you for that. I hope you found it um, uh, a little bit more engaging. Um, and thank you for this contribution. We will now move on to the uh, next part of our, uh, today's presentation. We call it uh, interactivity facilitation. And um, we will start this block uh, with um, presentation from um, Indra. And so I'm, I'm going to call to the floor uh, Juan again. Um, Welcome, Juan. You, you seem to be very popular today. Um, but in all seriousness, your presentation is uh, about claiming passenger rights. So a very important um, aspect of all concerned um, travelers. Uh, how, how can one ask for the compensation in case anything goes wrong with your trip? Um, OK, Juan, over to you then. Thank you, Aneta, for your introduction. Well, we have seen it in the interactive session that this is one of the most important things that for, for, for many people, how can I get easily refunded? So in this section, we will talk about passenger rights, uh, compensation claims, etc. In the same way that one of my answers, uh, I want to insist that we are working in technology so we are providing tools for the TSPs or uh, travel agencies or any other actor that is in the ecosystem to facilitate their operations. So can we go to the next slide? So I will follow a similar, um, a similar way of explaining this section. So what are the passenger rights? How can I claim them? What are the advantages for for passengers and operators with all the technologies that we are providing. So in, in the shift to rail environment, uh, you will be able to claim any passenger right. I mean, I insist you are able to claim it. Then it's up to the TSP <laughs> to let you know if this, if your claim it's it's funded or not. But uh, we have uh, tools to facilitate this process. So an example will be my train is delayed for 20 minutes and I could not attend the meeting. How can I make this claim? So we have developed uh, what we call the web portal or travel companion that basically is, is we have seen during the presentation the application, but we have this more or less the same functionalities in a web front. So you can access, access it through a URL. And from this web front, you will be able to uh, claim any issue that you had uh, in the trips that you have been uh, purchased or planned uh, with the IP4 ecosystem. So uh, then we have the operators. How can I how, how can I deal with all these things? 
So in 6.2rail, we have the below what is uh, a CRM that is uh, connected to the ecosystem. So it will have, it will be like a unique uh, one channel where the TSPs, they, once they have registered, they will see all the issues that are related to the, all the claims and they can reply through them. I mean, reply them through this one channel. So can we go to the next slide, please? So as I said, in the web front, you will have, you will be able to claim for uh, any issues that you had with the, any any itinerary that you have uh, planned with the travel company. So you can select the itinerary where you had an issue, and you will have this on um, uh, I mean, this page that is on the left side, submission of a claim, where you can select which is your name that is, all, of course, connected to the ones you have in, in IP4, your email, your phone, uh, which is the, the category type, etc. And this will be uh, sent to the, to the DSP. So this will be sent to, the, to a cloud wallet that is the, the virtual space of the user. And then it will be uh, notified to the, uh, through the CRM to the TSPs that are connected to the ecosystem. So can we go to the next slide? So then, depending, I mean, once the user has sent its, its claim, then we have two different ways of solving these issues, the automatic one and the manual one. The manual one is anything that cannot be solved automatically. My seat, where I was seated, was dirty or I had an issue, anything that needs to be checked by a person, this needs to be solved manually. So we will see in the next slide, so there will be a notification for the TSP, they will check the message and they will do manual check to, to, to let you know if your claim is funded or not. But we have also the automatic resolution. The automatic resolution, uh, we have been focused on, on delays. So what happens? If my train is late, the TSP that is responsible of this train has, in their systems, they know that this train was late. So in order to facilitate all this process, we have developed a module that is the, the passenger rights orchestrator that is able to connect with the system of the TSP in order to know automatically if that itinerary was laid by a certain TSP. So let's focus on this part in the automatic one. So can we go to the next slide, please? So as I said, we have developed the passenger rights orchestrator. That is a component that is, is responsible of orchestrating the request to each of the uh, system of the, of the TSPs. So once a user said, in this itinerary that has three legs, one train and two metros, I arrived late. So this will be automatically sent. The system will recognize that it's a, a delayed a claim. So it will be sent to the passenger rights orchestrator. Then through the interpretive framework that has been explained before, that is able to communicate the different TSPs without uh, adapting interface and, and protocol in order to not modify the systems of the of the TSPs. So this request will be converted to, for example, the interface of one of the operators, and, it, and they will ask you, this specific leg, was it late? And the system by automatically knows that the train was late. So they will say, yes, this train was late. Other TSPs, they will say, no, no, my, my section was okay. So I have nothing to do with this. I can, I, I do not have the obligation to refund this part because my service was working properly. So once the different TSPs, they reply to you automatically, my section was late, my section was not late, then it's coming back to the CRM. Next slide, please. The CRM, in, as I said, is, is more or less like the portal for the, for the operator. So they will see the different claims, they will include the information that is coming from the passenger rights orchestrator. So confirming that certain um, that my leg was late or my leg was not okay. And then the DSP is able to uh, 
to, to take an action that could be uh, replying by message saying that was not uh, a mere claim was not funded or yes. And if this claim was funded, then it will um, launch the, the reimbursement that is taken uh, that is taken by other components such as the after sales orchestrator. So um, can we go to the next slide, please? Try to not <laughs> pass my 10 minutes. So uh, once we have understood which is the process from the user till the TSP, I would like to insist that this is possible through the uh, component that has been developed in, in IP4. So the trial companion web that includes this complaint section where you can uh, send the information. I mean, with this process, the TSP will have the exact uh, leg that was late and etc. So all these processes avoiding phone, avoiding emails, avoiding paper, everything will be done through the ecosystem and will be done as fast as possible. All the information will be stored in the cloud wallet. That is one of the basic components of the, the ecosystem. We have the CRM that apart from this claim section has other uh, functions such as invoices and checking information of the users, etc. And the passenger rights orchestrator that I have explained before. So can we go to the next final slide? So the main outcome of this section is we have again developed innovative components that facilitate both sides, the user make easy complaints and for the TSPs that they are able to manage it easily as well. So this ends with an easy and quick submission and resolution of the claims. And in addition, this is compatible and traceable with the legacy systems. As I said, the interoperative framework is able to adapt the request to the interface and protocols of the TSPs, so they do not need to uh, adapt their systems. And I think this is it. I hope I explained it properly and, and you found it interesting. And otherwise, uh, do not hesitate to ask for any questions in the Q&A part. Thanks. Thank you, Juan. Um, yes, so please um, keep sending the questions if you have uh, for, for this session. And um, in the meantime, I'm going to welcome to the floor, welcome back to our virtual floor, Ahim from Ahaken, who will talk to us uh, about how fair dodging can be identified. Um, and it should be avoided. So, Ahim, over to you. Yep, thanks a lot, uh, Aneta. Um, so, as you can see, don't ride without a ticket. Uh, this is the main title of this session. Um, but behind this is uh, much more. Um, so, let's start with a short video that we have produced uh, for this final event. Uh, so, that, if you would start it, please. <laughs> This video will demonstrate how the inspection mode function can help ensure ticket purchasing occurs prior to travel. To begin with, passengers can purchase a ticket online and using our dedicated app. If a traveller chooses not to purchase a ticket, they can still board an arriving train. Once a journey begins, ticket purchasing can be temporarily blocked by the inspector.
it will not be possible for passengers to purchase a ticket after a journey begins. Easy ticket inspection with shift to rail travel companion helps prevent fare dodging. Well, thanks a lot. Um, so as I said, uh, the idea or behind this is to make this kind of um, <clears throat> ticket inspection uh, easy and not only to prevent fair dodging. Um, so we have created a specific uh, special in inspectors mobile application um, with which you are able to read and um, present tickets. Um, and with this application as well, uh, it can be blocking uh, the purchasing of tickets. So next slide, please. So the inspector's mobile, uh, once the inspector enters the train and wants to start his inspection, um, he can choose a color code um, and an additional uh, numeric code um, that makes it easy to read tickets uh, and to inspect tickets if they are valid or not. Um, and in addition, uh, through this Bluetooth signal, uh, which is broadcasting on the train, he can block ticket purchasing uh, from any mobile that is connected to the travel companion. So next slide, please. So uh, what you see here is uh, this would be a ticket um, and the, the information on this ticket is uh, written down there. So it's ticket 577 and so on and so forth. Um, and this ticket is stored uh, on the mobile and can be presented uh, to the inspector. And again, uh, the color code and uh, number uh, can help um, the inspector uh, to very quickly and easily uh, check if this ticket is valid or not. Next slide, please. And uh, when you're uh, starting your um, application, and as we have seen in the short video, uh, if you want to purchase a ticket on the train, uh, because it uh, quite often is possible to enter a train without a ticket and then purchase it uh, on that train uh, or bus. Um, so you can see here on the, the screenshots on the right side, there is one uh, to offer uh, in blue and another one which is gray. So normally uh, you are able um, to order and purchase a ticket. Um, and in case that the conductor is blocking um, ticket purchasing, uh, it cannot be used. Uh, so in this case, uh, you have uh, prevented this kind of um, fare dodging. So if you want to enter your train, uh, hopefully you will not uh, catch up by an, an inspector uh, and then ride without the ticket. So this is all about um, the idea of our um, easy, ticket checking on trains. Um, and uh, this have been my slides. Next slide, please. So thanks a lot for your attention. Um, and I'm ready for any kind of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ahim. So let's move on to um, our um, final presentation of today. Um, and this one comes from our colleagues from Shift to Mass project and will be presented by uh, Mr. Petr Buchniczek from Altis Group and Kvetoslav Havlik uh, from Cordis. So um, you will hear about the experiences and lessons that we've learned uh, from our Central East Corridor pilot. And indeed, I'm going to invite mm -hmm. Petr to the floor first. Welcome, Petr. Good afternoon. Yeah, well, uh, I would like to wrap up some uh, experience and lessons learned uh, from uh, conducting the pilot in the Central East Corridor. Uh, and not only from a passenger perspective, but uh, thanks to the participation 
uh, Mr. Havlik from Cordis, also from the perspective of the transport organizer uh, in the particular area. Next, please. Uh, so, uh, before we start uh, summarizing the, the outcomes from the pilots, I would like to introduce the original plan. Uh, at the beginning of the project, we find two uh, scenarios. The first one was uh, a student traveling from Vienna through Brno to Berlin. Uh, in Brno, uh, she should meet with a friend and they uh, plan to continue together. While the second scenario was a family traveling from Frankfurt uh, with a stopover in Prague and then continuing the next day through Brno to Lednice. Uh, however, uh, the pandemic restrictions prevented us from uh, traveling across border. Uh, that's why we decided to had to uh, change the, the scenarios and the plans. Uh, so next, please. Uh, yeah, so, so we decided to split the, uh, the, the pilot performance uh, among uh, indoor part uh, and the outdoor part. So the outdoor part was performed separately in Germany and in the Czech Republic, in the South Moravia region, uh, while the cross-border uh, traveling was tested in the indoor uh, pilot. Uh, altogether, 33 testers participated in, um, in the indoor part and then 40 of them continued testing uh, for two weeks in the outdoor part. Uh, so they were really uh, traveling, making use of the travel companion and the functionalities uh, displayed in the bottom part. Uh, next, please. Uh, yeah, instead of describing the pilot performance, we also took a short video. Yeah, we can start it. Lucia opens the application Travel Companion, logs in, enters the places of departure and arrival, and then clicks on the button Search. Travel Companion offers the travel connections to Lucia. Lucia chooses the most suitable connection, makes the reservation and the payment, and then checks the stored electronic tickets in My Trips. According to her agreement with Petra, she shares the trip from Brno to Lednica using the share button and by inserting Petra's email address, which she uses in the application. Petra receives the notification with the shared trip from Lucia. She finds the particular connection and makes the reservation and payment. In the last step, she checks that her trip is saved in My Trips.
Petra travels by public transport through Brno to the bus stations of Anarska. Both girls go to the train station so that they can take the train connection from Brno to Podivin. The girls get off the train and change to the bus connection from Podivin to Lednice. When boarding the bus, the driver validates the tickets using the validation application. Well, that was uh, depicting the uh, the, con the performance of the pilot in the in the Czech uh, part, uh, and now before starting contemplating on uh, the outcomes of the pilot performance, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Havli, who should introduce uh, a bit the way of uh, uh, the organization of transport in the Czech Republic, also the goals of this and their insights. Mr. Havli, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I hope you you can hear me. Yes, fine. Thank you. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kretoslav Havlik. I am from Cordis uh, JMK, which is the coordinator of public transport in the South Moravian region. And uh, I can say that uh, this project was for us very uh, interesting and important because uh, many of you already uh, discussed and speak about problems we already we are already solving in uh, in Ch southern Moravia and also in the Czech Republic. Uh, in Czech Republic, uh, the public transport organization is, I can say, quite well organized because there are three levels and maybe it could uh, serve as a good example also for other countries. On the national level, uh, Ministry, of, uh, Ministry of Transport is organizing uh, long distance transport, mostly uh, not international, but uh, uh, interstate public transport. And uh, on the regional level, we have 13 regions plus Prague. Uh, the regions, they uh, are organizing uh, all regional transport. It means both trains and regional buses. And third level are municipalities. Municipalities, they are responsible for urban public transport uh, in, inside of their borders. So this is quite clear for, for the state, uh, for the organization, for financing, and as well for operators. I think this solution is uh, works quite fine. And most of the regions, because regional public transport, uh, I can say, is the most uh, important for all the region because Ministry of Transport, they are supporting uh, uh, just very few of trains. Uh, but the regional transport is very important and most of the regions, they have uh, so-called co uh, coordinators or organizers of public transport and CORDIS is one of them. Uh, I can say that South Moravia is uh, a region which borders Slovakia and Austria and uh, therefore for us it's very important to improve and somehow uh, bring new ideas to cross-border public transport uh, because uh, you know many of our inhabitants or residents are traveling to Austria or to Slovakia or and also many Slovak people are traveling to Brno or to South Moravia so therefore uh, we are always trying to improve public transport and offer new services and we also know about the problems which uh, which are combined with the traveling uh, across the border. Maybe just uh, two points. 
it is important that uh, the transportation, the cross-border transportation between Czech Republic and uh, abroad is uh, by trains operated mostly by two operators, uh, Czech Railways and Tragiojet. It means that this market is quite clear, but on the other hand, uh, especially the tariffs and ticketing is quite expensive, are quite expensive and uh, it's not so comfortable for uh, for many users. On the other side, there are also lots of uh, bus lines operated by various private operators. Uh, the market is marginalized and uh, what is good is that the price for bus operators, for bus uh, international bus transport is quite uh, good, valued, but on the other side it's very difficult to find the right way because uh, some of the operators, they don't uh, operate regularly and they close their lines uh, quickly and open new lines very quickly. So it's also not very, conf so this is also not very clear and such uh, such application or such similar applications as has been uh, shown in previous presentations, I think uh, could be valuable for both types of transport. And at the end, just uh, uh, the regional transport, regional cross-border transport, this is organized by regions. And in our case, uh, please next slide. In our case, I can say that uh, we are successful and we have quite good contacts to Slovakia and Austria. Well, uh, for us, uh, the reason uh, why we entered the Shift to Mars project was, for example, was uh, for before all to enhance the cross-border traveling. As I told you, we are a bordering region and we need to improve uh, traveling possibilities for our residents and for tourists uh, to to the neighboring regions. I can say that uh, on the regional level. Uh, we are quite fine and we have quite uh, success in this point of view. But for example, if we want uh, to travel to Vienna airport, which is our main airport for South Moravia and for Moravia as a whole, uh, there is already problems because we cannot buy the single ticket or combined ticket directly from Brno or from other Moravian cities to Vienna airport. And uh, this is this is not big problem because we can buy the ticket on on the Vienna railway station but it could be it would be much more convenient if we can if we can buy just simple way one ticket which will uh, be valid for 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 example uh, trains and including the transportation between Vienna uh, main station main train station and airport so our expectations from the project was uh, to find or to study possibilities how to uh, how to connect the tariff systems across borders and improve the uh, cross border cooperation please next slide well, uh, our expectations uh, at the moment, I can say that we are quite ahead uh, regarding some uh, technical uh, issues in our uh, public transport system. Um, other pro other project partners, they were mostly based uh, on on the on their cities, but we are a bit different organization because we are representing all the region with uh, with a quite uh, middle sized uh, core city Brno, but the region is also for us very important and uh, in the Czech Republic. Uh, I can say that it's very good that public transport in our country is quite uh, well maintained and uh, well used, not only trains, but also regional and uh, national buses. So at the moment we have uh, quite uh, lots of uh, technical uh, measures or, or possibilities. For example, we have uh, API for all timetables, both static and dynamic, and we can offer this service for, for the for the application, we have position of vehicles. We, we are able to provide current departure times from stops and also we have information about irregularities in transport closures, detours and so on. And also our ticketing system is uh, at the moment uh, well functionable. We offer tickets uh, based on QR codes and we also uh, offer electronic tickets uh, combined with bank cards. And these systems have been already built uh, as, as uh, some kind of uh, back office for other applications which can be used for buying uh, tickets for our regional public transport. So 
I think that uh, our system is uh, well prepared for uh, applications like uh, uh, that one that was uh, produced by or, pre uh, or prepared by Shift to Mass project. Well, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, AP2 Travel Companion. That's exactly the application which uh, we are looking forward uh, uh, when it will be finished, finalized and uh, completed because I think such application is really uh, practical for travelers across Europe. I, I'm uh, sure that, for example, for traveling across in one region, for traveling for regular, uh, for regular uh, traveling to back to to job and back from my home, it uh, I will use always the same uh, local regional application because it uh, can offer more than this uh, widespread application. But if I uh, would like to travel somewhere, for example, to Vienna, to Bratislava, to other country. Uh, and I, if I want to combine uh, different types of transport, uh, such application uh, like a Travel Companion will be really useful. And I think it's really uh, it's really important to build such application as uh, cross-border applications, not only national application because uh, especially in the Central Europe, most of the states, they are small and most of the of the regions and cities are bordering to other other states and uh, it it's only a matter of time when the traveling uh, flow, when the travel flows between regions uh, between the borders will be even stronger than now. So I think that uh, we also have been uh, participated in testing of these applications. We uh, used our own employees and also customers of uh, our system. And I can say that uh, the results from this testing were quite fine. And I think that Mr. Buchnicek will speak about it later. Please, next slide. Yes, and impressions and insights uh, from our side. I can say that uh, the concept of integrated of all necessary steps uh, for passenger is is the future. Yeah, and uh, somebody of you already said that uh, the mass is uh, the thing which uh, passengers and people want. And I'm also sure that uh, this uh, mobility as a service concept uh, will be very strongly supported in the future. For example, I guess that in many of your countries and uh, your cities, you have already uh, these uh, electric electro scooters and electro bikes and shared scooters and so on. In Brno, it is uh, also uh, very popular, but the problem is that uh, these services don't uh, communicate and don't cooperate with public transport and uh, it's also not very easy because public transport is not private, usually not private and these scooters are private and they are trying to find their place on the market. But uh, on the other side, uh, it's a task for cities, for municipalities, maybe for regions to find the way how to cooperate with them. And uh, therefore I can say that uh, such application uh, which will combine the cross-border transportation with these mass uh, uh, sustainable services uh, will be successful, but it is necessary to uh, continue in its uh, operation and preparation and uh, naturally Cordis is willing and ready to continue uh, testing and uh, further development of these of such services. Thank you for your attention. Well, uh, and in the last two slides, uh, I'd like to uh, elaborate on the outcomes we collected from the pilots. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to uh, describe the indicators we consider important uh, for possible success of uh, the, the solution uh, we are working on altogether. Uh, well, uh, it's obvious that we are not starting from scratch. Uh, the users of uh, the IP4 ecosystem uh, are used to using different uh, solutions on the market. Uh, they already travel, they, uh, they search for connections in the journey planners they know, they buy tickets online, etc. 
So in order to uh, persuade them that uh, our solution is uh, somehow better in something, uh, we need to uh, take care about uh, some aspects of the solution. Uh, the first one, which is quite important, uh, again, it's not our private opinion, it's based on the uh, feedback we collected from the testers in the pilot, is the uh, is the attractiveness of the solution itself i mean uh, the design of the application uh, the way uh, the users may work with with it if it is easy to use if everything is understandable simple uh, possibly customized because each user has a different preferences uh, etc uh, this is uh, this is something uh, highlighted uh, many times because regardless of the data content of the quality of the information provided by the solution uh, if it is hard to understand uh, or hard to find uh, hidden somewhere in the application uh, a functionality not expected by the user etc uh, it's uh, not uh, considered uh, okay uh, uh, I mentioned also the added value because the uh, the other aspect uh, how to persuade the customers to switch to a new solution from the one they are used to using is uh, some kind of uh, incentives uh, i mean the the economic benefits uh, or some added value it may be either if they are keen on innovative approach uh, something there uh, previous application does not provide uh, it's partially uh, connected with the, uh, with the with the content uh, with the data content of uh, of the solution or the information it can provide uh, this takes the second body uh, which i named integration so uh, even if the application is is very easy to use uh, understandable well designed uh, the customer feels well treated if the information it provides is uh, not bad but let's say uh, uh, restricted to a particular area only then of course it prevents the widespread of, uh, of such a solution so the integration is a way uh, to get uh, more information in, in in the solution more to involve more travel modes more uh, providers of uh, of the services uh, to put everything in one place not only the journey planning but also payment for uh, traveling entitlements even some after sale services etc uh, the other important indicator is a guidance uh, it's something again it's an added value comparing to the existing solutions uh, the travel companion uh, is able to act uh, like uh, a concierge uh, service. That's uh, that's why we call it a companion. Uh, it helps, especially in case of uh, irregularities like uh, delays, uh, rerouting of uh, of trains, uh, track changes, or even cancellation of services. Uh, then, uh, if it provides the real-time information, some indoor navigation in large uh, train stations or airports, uh, reaccommodation services, then again, it's uh, comparing to the existing solution. Uh, it's, it's it's something uh, which we can consider an added value, which may attract the solution uh, in the competition with with the existing solutions. And the last but uh, but not least, uh, reliability. Uh, it's about uh, the results the solution provides. So even if uh, if it is full of information, uh, well designed, easy to use, if the user realizes that maybe I don't mean that the information provided by the solution is wrong, but uh, they may realize that something is missing for example another possibility how to get to the destination or uh, a better price for for the ticket uh, or something like that then again it discourages the possible users from using that particular application instead of the one they are used to uh, well and uh, concerning the competitiveness yeah maybe the next slide please 
the final recommendations for uh, future uh, development for upgrading the solution. Uh, I listed two of them. The first recommendation is mind the competitiveness, but keep user friendliness. That means you know parameters like performance best results, best price functionalities. We heard about it in the previous presentation. Uh, the possibility of uh, after sales claims uh, in case of uh, some uh, issues. Uh, also the comprehensibility. Uh, some testers claim that they miss the, uh, the, the help functionality, uh, I mean the, the explanation of some parts of the application. And of course, the very important part, if we plan to, to spread it across Europe, if you are talking about pan-European solution, then the solution must support multiple languages and currencies. Uh, of course, uh, it requires some further development, as I said, because not all the features we planned are completed already. Uh, it's uh, corresponding to the technical readiness expected at the beginning of the project because we are still on the on the research level, uh, not developing directly the end user solution able to be deployed for the uh, common use uh, the day after uh, the project ends, but uh, but it has to be taken into consideration. Uh, the second one recommendation is to foster interoperability. Interoperability is a key uh, aspect of the entire IP4 program, uh, in my understanding. Uh, it's one of the original concepts uh, we want to prove by the, uh, by the solution uh, we are talking about. Uh, one of the um, important uh, aspects is that uh, the, the, the interoperability framework, a part of the solution which uh, enables the stakeholders to join the ecosystem with uh, almost no efforts on their side, no cost uh, for uh, necessary work to adapt to the, to the, uh, to the formats, the, the application or the solution communicates, etc. Uh, is a key. Uh, everything is based on providing the, uh, the description of the services from stakeholders and uh, granting the access to their services and that's all. Uh, and the ecosystem is able to adapt uh, itself. Uh, the second point is the decentralization. Uh, it's uh, not uh, uh, good to try to centralize all the possible data in one place. Uh, instead, it's much better to make the most of remote services because the local providers, all the stakeholders involved and uh, uh, involved already or, uh, or thinking about their involvement in the future, uh, know the best uh, the current situation, the tariffs, the mm, uh, uh, the, the changes uh, on, on daily basis, they occur and, uh, and uh, it's always much harder to, to uh, shift the information elsewhere. Uh, it's much better to make use of the local services and to, uh, to uh, connect them into one uh, ecosystem. And the last point uh, is uh, the motivation for stakeholders. I think it has been also mentioned in one of the question and answers. Uh, yeah, we have to think about the business model uh, uh, in order to motivate the stakeholders to uh, to want to join the ecosystem to the solution. I think that's also important uh, recommendation for for the next steps. Uh, that's all from my side. Thank you, Pet, and um, thank you for, for this interesting uh, presentation indeed. Um, and that brings us to the next um, agenda item, which is actually a question and answers uh, session. So um, as previously, please just use the facility, click on the ask a question button to um, ask any questions you may have. I'm going to give you um, a minute or so to gather your thoughts and uh, please post your questions uh, now. Uh, 
Okay. So we do have a question, um, which um, I believe is addressed to Ahim. Um, Ahim, we have a question which uh, reads, how does blocking ticket purchase on the train guard against fair dodging? It would seem to prompt, promote it, or did I misunderstand? Uh, well, um, I guess it's a misunderstanding. So the idea is um, <clears throat> that um, if you try to, to um, be a fair dodger, um, so not really, but, but if you want to be one, you can enter a train um, and you hope uh, that there will no um, conductor checking your tickets. Um, and if a conductor comes in, uh, you could normally easily just buy your ticket using your mobile very quickly. You can pay it and that's it. Um, and preventing this, um, so make a gray driver to a black driver, uh, you can just block the purchase of the ticket. So that's the idea. Did I get your question? Hopefully, yes. Uh, if not, yeah, please post the follow up questions and let me move to um, another question, um, which uh, reads. So this is a question to Juan, I believe it says thanks to Juan for good answers. Um, is it env envisaged that uh, an IP4 travel companion would be in connection with the EU as vendor in the absence of independent travel agencies? or travel operator, retail opera operations, providing their own travel companions. Um, Juan, do you want to take this one, please? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for, for this question. Um, as I said before, this is not something that we are dealing uh, in IP4. It's not we are uh, focused on technology. But uh, as a personal point of view, not as IP4, this could be one of the the solution that I imagine that uh, EU will take the whole ecosystem and, and be as open as possible. But as I said, that is not something we have been dealing in our project, so I cannot give you a, an answer as I before, but that, as you said, could be one of the options. Yes. Thank you, Juan. We have another question um, which says, do you handle mass passenger ride schemes as well? If yes, how? If no, what are the challenges here? I Would think like I to can take, take this one. Thank you, Norman. One. Um, so currently, as almost any service that the Shifter ecosystem provides, we're relying here on functionality that is already existent on TSP side. Um, for this passenger um, rides module or the passenger rights um, implementation as Juan described it. Um, we have a, a partner in Shifter Rail that is providing such a functionality to us and um, we're orchestrating those services. Um, currently this particular instance only cares about public transport, but if there was such a module on the side of any TSP, we would be able to integrate it as long as it's, let's say, closely enough um, to what we are currently have. Of course, there's no standard on exchanging passenger rights um, requests and responses, but um, we would be willing to at least help with um, identifying um, usual concepts um, in regards to passenger rights interaction between um, a TSP and an ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Norman, for this. Um, for the sake of time, uh, I propose we move on. Um, and as mentioned already, uh, just to, to remind everyone, we will um, answer all other questions that were posted and we didn't have time to answer live. So um, please refer back to, to our recording. Um, we will post the answers then and there. Um, so that brings us to a final um, session, which is really a summary of um, today's um, event. And we've um, uh, we've invited Achim uh, von der Emse from, from Haken, who, as I mentioned before, is a massive project technical lead. 
uh, and vice chair of IP4 uh, program indeed, um, to share his thoughts as to um, what is next, what is next that um, Innovation Program 4 um, should be doing. Um, so Ahim, over to you. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks, Lerenetta. Well, this is really one of the difficult tasks uh, today because we have learned so many things and have seen so many things um, from different perspectives, uh, from the operator's perspective, from the passenger's perspective, um, client's perspective, and so on. But first of all, let me uh, thank all of <coughs> the colleagues, all of the um, speakers uh, to their speeches uh, from today. Special thanks as well to uh, Martin with his um, uh, introduction uh, words uh, as keynote speaker uh, for Mars. And um, I think we're on a good way, um, but we still have to do a lot of things. Um, but let's go a little bit into more detail of what we have seen today. Um, and I would like to start uh, with the um, Massive project. So um, we have heard uh, in, in the first uh, session from, from Juan, uh, who explained uh, mobility packages, uh, how can they be created, um, how operator can take part, uh, and these kind of um, services that is needed uh, to really create massive um, approaches um, and to enable um, passengers uh, to purchase up to their needs, uh, their trips and uh, travel uh, ideas. Uh, so in the next step, Norman explained uh, us uh, a little more technical uh, detailed um, how journeys are planned in our system. So we explained the two-step approach uh, with a meta network. And then um, after the pre-trip is defined, um, <clears throat> the um, operators, uh, we call them TSP, so travel service providers, um, will handled their um, trips directly that then can be forwarded uh, to the users. Thereafter, uh, I myself uh, explained to you um, what about multi-user capabilities are. Um, we have heard about uh, these two, three use cases for trip sharing, uh, travel arrangement, and groups of travelers. Um, and then uh, Juan um, from CS Group, um, explained us a bit of the new world. Um, so augmented reality, um, we all know these uh, Google glasses. So we all know that this is currently not common in the market. Um, but what we wanted to do as well is uh, to have a slight view into the future. What can, do, uh, what can we do uh, with these ideas? How can we travel uh, through stations? And we all know uh, from time to time, we um, have a longer stop over in the station uh, and it is quite important to get information um, of what we can do on these stations, um, get visual information when your train leaves um, so that you can proceed your travel um, <clears throat> as you want to do. Um, thereafter, Juan again uh, explained um, the claim of passenger rights. Um, which is as well an important issue as what we have seen uh, in the survey as well um, in our, in our um, special session, uh, what you want to see about mass um, systems. So, so what about um, if uh, your train is delayed, you do not uh, reach your connection train or your um, flight may be canceled, uh, all these things. Um, so passenger rights is a very important thing. Um, and Juan explained uh, some tools of this, uh, how this can be done. Um, and finally, in the, in the massive um, sessions, I again um, explained then uh, fare dodging. Uh, and as I've seen one of this question um, in, in, the, in the chat, um, it is not uh, used to really um, prevent fair dodging, um, but uh, made it easy for uh, conductors uh, and for inspectors um, to check tickets uh, very quickly and to prevent selling of tickets if someone enters a train hoping that he is not be conducted and, and not be um, inspected. Um, and uh, well, then be figured out. 
So this was all uh, what we have heard uh, for Massive. Um, then um, within the um, Shifter Mass um, project, um, we have uh, in the first uh, part uh, learned from uh, Marco um, the methods, um, how Shift Rail uh, was set up. Um, <clears throat> we have heard from uh, Lisbon um, pilots um, and um, how the uh, diff different uh, scenarios uh, are figured out. Uh, so in these two workshop, uh, as is workshop and to be it workshop. Zhao then explained um, the um, Lisbon um, pilot, um, which uh, gives uh, passengers and operators uh, more information um, <clears throat> and um, experiences uh, from this um, pilot. And uh, he said that um, the flex, so, so these uh, kind of operators and these kind of travel companions is really a um, flagship, uh, flagship initiative, uh, which uh, we definitely uh, should uh, go on with. Um, then Daniel explained uh, surveys, um, figuring out um, the um, passengers' preferences. And uh, finally, uh, Peter and Kveslov um, explained the Central East Corridor, uh, what they have done there. Um, especially uh, Peter uh, informed about cross-border traveling, uh, which uh, nowadays is still not that common and uh, quite difficult. So these kind of travel companion and um, development that we have done helps uh, passengers uh, to really um, go uh, cross borders. Um, and Kretoslav uh, pointed out um, that it is very important um, that um, operators can very easily join uh, the IP4 ecosystem because, um, again, the IP4 ecosystem, um, I, main idea is to really um, make it very, very easy for TSPs, uh, for operators, to join the system, uh, so not only these big companies, but uh, small companies, small bus companies, temporary companies as well, to join the ecosystem and, um, well, pursue passengers to take public transport. So what's coming next? Um, so Marco in the beginning, uh, next slide please. Uh, Marco in the beginning uh, said that uh, we have a complete timeline. Um, you all know that uh, the shift to rail joint undertaking will end uh, in the first half of 2023. Um, we are still working uh, for these uh, travels for door-to-door, -door, pan European travels. This is very important, really door-to-door. -door. Uh, so including private transport, so uh, transport, uh, so is it footwork or your own bike or, or, or sharing um, bikes? So we have, um, the um, project extensive um, in uh, direct uh, link to a massive um, idea of extensive is first of all um, to go on with the work that we have started with to put it onto a TRL seven um, and uh, some additional features and one of them is um, to integrate SAS services um, again for easy. Uh, integration of uh, small TSPs. IP for Mars, um, the follow-up project of Shift to Mars um, will run as well pilots. Uh, so the final pilots of the Shift Rail joint undertaking IP4 initiative. Um, and uh, we will see what IP4 outcomes uh, bring us as the result of uh, Shift to Rail. Um, so this is uh, what's coming now uh, and in the future. Um, on the next slide, please. Um, we are now the um, word uh, new normal. Um, we all know that uh, due to uh, COVID-19, um, we all are working more or less um, online. Um, so this session normally would take place in Brussels somewhere uh, and we all could see each other and have our side uh, talks uh, at, at coffee breaks. Uh, this is all new uh, on these uh, online uh, things. 
as well, we heard this um, as well this day um, that COVID-19 impacted for sure uh, our project. Um, but what we as well talk about all the time is the reduction of carbon footprint. Um, so a lot of ideas uh, regarding uh, how this can be done are circulated through news. Um, our idea and vision is, uh, again, to convince travelers to use public transport um, instead of private transport. And if it is necessary um, to um, use private transport, <clears throat> then it would be great uh, to share uh, your ride uh, on your private car maybe, uh, so prevent traveling alone. And this, uh, no matter where you want to go, and again, door to door. So let me sum up with just one single sentence. Uh, in the future, let traveling be public transport, be the new normal. So that's uh, our wish, uh, and that is our aim. And uh, with this sentence, I would like to close. Thanks a Thank lot for you. listening. Thank you very much, Achim. I think it's a very appropriate um, ending um, for our event today. In fact, we've reached the, the conclusion of uh, today's presentation. So thank you everyone in the audience for your participation, active participation in our interactive session. Thank you for your numerous questions. It was um, very good to see that um, and, and prompt us to think about what we are doing um, if we are actually addressing the questions that are important. I would, uh, I would also like to take this, um, this opportunity to thank all our presenters today, including our keynote speakers. Um, most of all, I would actually like to thank all project partners in both projects, Massive and shift to mass as well as their link third parties, without whom these technical developments would not have been made. So um, a lot of work uh, ha has been done to let us to today to showcase you some of the functionalities that we've developed and uh, share the findings. I would like to uh, thank our um, advisory group members who um, are steering our work and advising us as to um, what, how to improve the um, work that we are conducting. And uh, finally, uh, of course, I would like to uh, thank Shift to Rail joint undertaking for, for this opportunity, for your help uh, and for your uh, support in actually um, being able to um, conduct this research and uh, develop those functional, all functionalities um, and studies as we did. Thank you all. Have a good rest of the day, uh, have a great rest of the week and um, as mentioned at the very beginning, you can find um, more of the details on all that we do uh, at our project websites, uh, so both um, Shift to uh, Mass and Massive. Um, this video from today will be published at the Shift to Rail website as well, so you can uh, refer back to it if you wish to. Thank you all. Have a good day. Bye.